unseen hand. The Apostle Paul said the invisible God. Amen. Turn to Psalm chapter 56 with me tonight, please, in verse number 8. The 56th Psalm and verse number 8. The psalmist says, Thou tellest my wonderings. Put thou my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? Father, bless this holy word now. In thy holy name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. You and I both know tonight that God puts value in places that men don't. We both know tonight that God sees as we don't see. We both know tonight that God's ways are not man's ways. We both know tonight that God is almighty in the sense that he knoweth all things. We call that omniscience. He knows everything. He knows the end and the beginning. He has never had anything happen. He's never had a, uh, an occurrence that uh, caught him off guard. He has never to react to anything. He does it according to his own will. And when it comes to tears, it comes to these things that men pay, don't, do not pay much attention to, uh, they mean a lot to God. They mean a lot to God if they come from the heart and they originate from the soul. In the book of Revelation, chapter number 5 and verses 7 and 8, the Bible said, He came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials, full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. Prayers from the heart, no doubt, offered up with great tears and crying, as he did in Hebrews chapter number 5. Into the presence of God, they're not prayed in vain. When you call upon the Lord and your prayer ascends to heaven, it ascends into the heart of one who understands it. It ascends into the heart of one who's sympathetic to it. It ascends into the heart of one who has compassion toward you Amen. and knows exactly how to carry that prayer into the ear of the Lord. In the eighth chapter of the book of Romans, he makes it plain that we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh groanings or utterances for us according to the will of God. What we have to do when we pray is trust God that our prayer may be stumbling and it may be faltering and we may not have an idea of what we should be praying for, but if our heart's right, it'll get there. And it'll not only get there, it'll get there in the fashion God wants it to be there. Amen. The reason for that is because he wants to encourage you to pray. He wants you to keep praying. If Satan can stop you from praying, folks, he's going to stop you dead in your tracks in your Christian life. You've got to keep praying. Prayer is one of the most precious things and one of the most precious gifts that God has given us as Christians. And I believe that a prayer that is bathed in tears reaches into the throne room of God and there he keeps it. He keeps it. Imagine, my friend, in the book of Revelation, when he opens this up and it has the prayers of the saints that have been there for thousands of years. Not one single prayer falls to the ground of that one that knows the Lord and loves him and prays in the will of God. So prayers are very, very precious in the sight of God and prayers bathed in tears. He said, would you put my tears in your bottle? Would you remind yourself of how life is on this earth? Would you remind yourself of how we can hurt and how the sorrow and the problems and pain that come our way? Remember the man I told you about this morning sitting by the bedside of his wife with Alzheimer's while everybody else is going about their daily affairs? This man sits there and he holds the hand of the one most precious to him on the face of the earth. Don't you know that many prayers have been offered up for her? Don't you know that he's weeping? Don't you know that these are contained in a bottle? I want you to notice what happens in heaven because this is important. These prayers are in a vial and they're, being con and they're contained. But notice as you read in chapter number 8 and verses 3 through 6 of Revelation, And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire off the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. What's happening in heaven is in the tribulation period, he's about to pour wrath down upon this earth. But if you notice what's directly connected with the opening up of this wrath and the revealing of the wrath of God against the earth are the prayers of the saints, the prayers of God's people. Don't you know they're precious in his sight? 
They're very precious in his sight. And God's people for thousands of years have endured, yea, long suffered what's happened to them upon this earth. In Hebrews chapter number 11, you'll read what's called the hall of faith of the saints of God who have endured great hardship and troubles and trials and, yea, have become even martyrs for our Lord Jesus Christ. But folks, make no mistake about it. He hasn't forgotten one prayer and he hasn't missed one tear that's been shed and prayed in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah to God. Amen. So prayers are important to God. Tears that bathe the prayer. In the book of Isaiah, chapter number 38 and verse 5, the Bible said, Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus saith Jehovah, the Lord God, the God of, di of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will add unto thy days fifteen years. And if, you, if you've read your Old Testament, you know that the prophet came to him and said, Set your house in order, you're going to die and not live. And Hezekiah gathered up the letters and took them into the temple of God, spread them out before the Lord. And God heard his prayer and saw his tears. That's quite, that's quite instructive. He heard the prayer. It enters into the heart of God. But God took time to see the tear that flowed from his soul. And Hezekiah, of course, was a good king, folks. He was a, one of the kings of many, many of the kings of Judah. And he loved the Lord and he served him. And so God heard that and he saw the tears. In Jeremiah chapter number 9 and verse 1, Oh, that my head were waters and mine eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Oh, that God would give us preachers that had a fountain of tears from their eyes and that they would love the people and love the truth and that they would get the word of God out and minister it regardless of filthy lucre and numbers in a church and being accepted by the clique in the crowd. It's far more important than a minister of the word of God is faithful and faithful to the truth of God's word than he is with anything else. It doesn't matter what people think about you. What did they think about Christ? The Jews said he was demon-possessed. The Romans wanted to get rid of him because he was causing them problems. The only thing Pilate was concerned about was the peace of Rome. And when the Lord Jesus Christ became a problem, he wanted shed of him. But once he had tried him, he said, I find no fault in this man. And he certainly didn't, for he wasn't. Amen. He said, you're a king. Where's your kingdom? He said, my kingdom is not of this world. Right. He said, if my kingdom were this world, then would my servants fight. Mo folks, they will fight. In Revelation chapter number 19, verse 11, I saw heaven open. Behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. It's hard for people to believe that the lowly Galilean, the meek and lowly Lamb of God, would come with a sharp two-edged sword, and he's coming as a man of war. But he did. He is. For the earth will never offer up the kingdoms of this world freely. I've lived in it long enough to understand that. It will never offer up the kingdoms of this. They will scratch and claw and fight and kill and war against each other as long as they're on the face of this earth to take and submit and conquest and empires and whatever they got to do to make the money and the land and whatever. Men will kill men as long as men are on this earth. But when the heavens open and a sword comes out of glory and one sitting on a white horse, he puts them down where they belong. And he rules them with a rod of iron for a thousand years. And he makes his point at the end of a thousand years. He shows all of mankind that even though they've been subjected, the Bible says in the book of Psalm, kiss the son lest he be angry. They will kiss his feet, yet they will still not love him in their heart. He forces no man to love him. But I love him tonight because he loved me. I love him tonight because he's lovable. I love him tonight because he's pure love. I love him because he loved me when I was a sorry, low-down, stinking, dirty dog. Amen. He loved me, and therefore I serve him tonight. Whether the kingdoms of this world are his at this moment or not, they're not, folks. And the church will never establish the kingdom on this earth. The church will never bring in peace. I don't care how many peacemakers meet at the U.N. signed agreements. It's not going to happen. The only way you will ever have peace is to have peace in the heart. The heart's got to change. And so it is. Jeremiah wept for his people. He was a prophet that cared for his people. He cared for them. He loved them. He wept for them. Has God Almighty seen you weep lately? When was the last time a tear rolled down your cheek and dropped down to the floor? When was the last time you ever got the surface of your Bible wet from praying and weeping over the Word of God? You say, it's been a long time, preacher. What dried up your fountain of tears? 
Isn't that something? Isn't that precious? That you can weep, that you can cry, that you can sorrow with others that sorrow, that you can have compassion on them, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. When one of your numbers lying in the hospital, hurting and suffering, you feel compelled to go and offer them a hand of consolation, get by their side and pray with them. Just let them know that you care, that's all. Just let them know you care about them. And that's what matters. That's how you build relationships. That's how characters form. It's when you show each other you love each other. It's not the hoop and the holler that you got in the building when you're in front of people and the accolades that are handed out and the awards and the rewards and all of that. It's when you go out into the, it alone and nobody's watching you and you go out and you help each other. You bear one another's burdens. You don't stick your nose into somebody else's business. You're not a busybody. Paul warned about the women that went from house to house and were busybodies. No, it's not about being a busybody. It's about ministering Christ. It's about pouring oil in the oil and the wine. It's about rising above what we are here. Folks, listen. Most of the people out here in this world are just like this, just, just like this. They're going here and they're going there. They're going here and they're going there. They're making good time, but they don't have a clue where they're going. Amen. They don't know where they're going. They don't know where they came from. They don't know where they're going. But I'm making good time. <laughs> Sure you are, and I know where I'm going. Amen. Get the hand of some soul that's weeping and weep with them. Get the hand of some soul that's hurting and just sit there and pray with them. Get the hand of somebody who's going through a hard time. Don't judge them. Don't try to, don't try to, don't try to understand all the reason for everything that's happening to somebody. You, listen, you'll drive yourself insane trying to do And don't listen to people either. Most people don't know what they're talking about anyway. Uh, you don't know why people are going through what they're going through. Uh, we go through stuff on this earth. Just help this be there. And sometimes you don't have to say a thing. Did you know that Job's friends were his friends until they started talking? <clears throat> Amen. Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar were the greatest friends in the world until they opened their mouth. Amen. Until they opened their mouth. For seven days, isn't it seven days? They didn't say a word. They just came from the east, and they came, and they heard about Job, and they came, and they sat down with Job, and they just sat there. That was comfort for Job. It would be for me. But then they started talking. Oh, boy. Then they started revealing their heart. Then were they a comfort to Job? No, they were condemnation from that moment on. So in the book of Malachi, chapter number 2, verses 13 through 17, the Scripture says, And this have you done again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and with crying out so insomuch that he regardeth not the offering anymore or receiveth it with good will at your hand. You hear that? Yet ye say, wherefore? Why? Why don't you receive my offering, Lord? Here we are. We're bringing you the best of the best. We're giving you a tenth. Yea, we're even giving an offering above our tithe. What's the problem, Lord? And here I'm crying. Look at this. They say, Why? Because Jehovah the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, uh-oh, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously, uh-oh. Yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. Now, folks, uh, American culture has lost what that means. And I can't get into too much detail with you tonight because of a mixed audience in here. But if you want to find out what's going on in this culture, just get home and get a hold of a good dictionary or a commentary and let them tell you what that means, covenant, what that has to do with. That when a man and a woman come together as husband and wife and uh, in, that, in that covenant, there's proof that there's a binding relationship and that proof is positive and that proof is visible, then you've got a covenant that is established between the two. And if you'll notice throughout, well, that's far enough. I won't get into too much of it. I'll just give you enough tonight to think about what I'm saying. He took, her as his, he took her as a wife, as youth, as a young woman. This was his wife. She begins to age. She's no longer 17. She's not 18 anymore. And then, of course, if his relationship with her is built on the flesh, then his flesh is going to wonder. He's going to wonder, and he's going to start looking at other. And he'll start looking back at the 17- and 18-year-olds and the 20-somethings. And he'll forget about the wife of his youth, and he'll say, enough of you. And away he goes, and he destroys the family relationship. You see, it's important to God. The family relationship is very important to God. 
and the American culture is anti-family. How many agree with that tonight? It is anti-family. And if you can destroy the husband and wife, you'll get the children. And if you get the children, you're going to make, you're going to make zombies out of them. You're going, to, you're, going to, you're going to brainwash them. And then, of course, you're going to affect a whole generation. And that's what's happening. You're watching the effect of a whole generation. Did you, did you know that a man uh, just two or three days ago cut his mother's head off? Cut his mother's head off, and I forget the details. It's something with some nothing in the house. She wanted him to do chores or something, and he cut her head off. You're seeing wild, extreme, demonic activity in this country that defies understanding. It's crazy, and it's not just isolated here and isolated. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. And the reason for that is because a whole generation now is vulnerable to demonic uh, influence and attack. And the reason for that is because the home has been destroyed. Don't look to the government to build your home. Don't look to the school system to define a home. Amen. Get the Bible. Read the Word of God. Find out what the Bible says about a husband and wife and children and what make a home. That's where you need to go, to the Word of God. God says, you put all your prayers and you can weep and you can cry all you want to, but I'm not going to hear it until you get this straightened up. There's a problem. You see, God has always been for the underdog. He always has. The oppressed. The, the, tro the trodden down. The one that is highly esteemed among men is an abomination to God. That's the way he works. And, and the Americans still, to this day, to their credit, thank God to their credit, pull for the underdog. And the reason they do it is because it's a remnant of what we had once been. They still pull for the underdog because of what we had once been. This was at one time a sterling nation, a nation of Christian principles. No, everybody wasn't a Christian, no. And all the presidents weren't Christians, no. And all the signers of the Declaration of Independence were not Christians, no. But they were not anti-Christ either. And we've come a long way, baby. You remember those cigarettes that came out back in the 60s or 70s? What did they call them? What was it? Virginia Slims. I remember when they first came out. I remember when they first came out, and, um, and, and that little slogan was, You've come a long way, baby. All right? And in other words, it's connecting Virginia Slims with feminism and the progressive liberal movement. And it was a big deal back then. When that slogan came out, everybody, everybody you saw was talking about, have you seen that? You've come a long way, baby. And they were making jokes about it. And the reason because it was such an affront to the culture of that age, of that time, it was so different. Anymore? <laughs> you kidding? What? This jaded generation? You know what jaded means? Let me, let me tell you what jaded means, all right? Jaded means that you have seen enough killings to where another killing doesn't bother you. That's jaded. That's jaded. Is this generation jaded? Yes, sir, it's jaded. So the Lord said to Malachi, thus it is. In the, book of, uh, in the book of Luke chapter number 19 and verse number 41, and when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. The Lord Jesus wept over Jerusalem. You notice that there's no condescending, patronizing attitude here. He opens up his heart and he cries out for Jerusalem. And he says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that stonest the prophets and killest them which are sent unto thee, how oft I would have gathered you. I have come to save you, not condemn you. I have come to help you, not destroy you. I have come to give my life as a ransom for many. And so he wept over the city. Now, he's not weeping all the time, but he wept there. In John 11:35, 35, he wept at the tomb of Lazarus. He wept. Do you know why he wept? Because he's being prepared as your high priest. He had to know experientially how it felt to lose someone close to you. He knows how it feels. Have you ever had that feeling? Have you ever lost anybody close to you? Have you ever buried a mother or a father, a son or a daughter, or a husband or a wife? Have you ever buried someone that's very near and dear to you? I remember a long time ago, been 35, 40 years ago now, a young man and his wife, his young bride, hadn't been married much, had been married long at all. And she had a cerebral hemorrhage, a cerebral hemorrhage. She was bleeding in the brain. 
and she grabbed her head and screamed about what a horrible headache. Her head was hurting her so bad. And they took her to the emergency room and she was dead within just a few hours from the time that came. And oh, how his heart was broken because his sweet bride was gone. I remember another young man, young man, married to a young bride. She was diagnosed with cancer. She wasted away over a long period of time. And then she eventually passed away. I remember her wedding ring. She was li her body was lying in the casket, and I remember she had her wedding ring. That was her hope, her future, her love, her life in this world. She loved her husband, yet it was all gone. See, she wasn't. She her lot in life was not to live to be seventy or eighty or ninety years old. And he wept. Believe me, he wept. He wept over his sweetheart who was gone, taken from him. One leaves in just a matter of a few short hours. Another wastes away over a period of time. But in either case, tears are shed for loved ones as they leave this world. Does God hear them? Yes, he does. Does God care? Yes, he cares. Can God help you? Yes, he can. Your great high priest, by the power of the Holy Spirit of God, ministers the grace of God to you for every situation and need that we have. And I want grace. Grace, grace, grace. I want mercy and I want grace. I want God to be merciful. I want him to be gracious to me. I don't want justice. I don't know what's due me. I want God to be merciful and gracious to me. And he does. He ministers grace. Grace, grace for every need. Grace for the hour. Hallelujah. Saving grace, dying grace, living grace, all the grace that we need. In the book of Hebrews, chapter number 5 and verse 7, who in the days of his flesh when he'd offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. Did God see the tears of the Son of God? Sure he did. Was he crying in Gethsemane? Sure he was. Was he afraid to go to the cross at Calvary? Absolutely not. That had nothing to do with Calvary. This has to do with something much, much darker, deeper, and more of a separation from God that he was about to descend into. A place of the wrath of Almighty God being poured out upon him for he was about to become sin for us who knew no sin. Go home and think about that. That's a mind-boggling statement. Don't let it just cross your mind quickly. He who knew no sin became sin for us. He not only was the sin offering, he was sin itself, bearing in his body on the tree the curse and condemnation for all of us. Nobody until we get to glory will we ever know the depths of sorrow that he descended into by taking my place. And that's what he was weeping about. And did, was he heard? Yes, he was. God saved him from it. He pulled him out of it and raised him up to the right hand of the Father. Yes, he did. See, the problem is that if you make that the cross in Hebrews 5, 7, and say that the cross is what he had in view and that he was, that he was afraid of the cross, then God didn't hear him because he went to the cross and he died on the cross. And he gave his life at the tree. No, the Bible says, For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of Almighty God. In Genesis chapter number 45 and verse 15, he kissed his brethren and wept over them, and after that his brethren talked with him. Who is that? That's right, Joseph. That's Joseph. That's Joseph. That's Rachel's son. That's Joseph. And he is the one they sold into slavery. And he's one of the most beautiful pictures in the Old Testament because he had every reason to be angry. He had every reason to hate his brethren. He had every reason to be full of vindictiveness, to have a, to have a vendetta. He had every reason to come back at them. Remember Esau? You remember what Jacob, when he did, what he did to Esau, and then Jacob fled, then he came back to the land, and they told Jacob, they said, here's your brother, he's got 400 men with him, and Jacob started shaking because Jacob thought Esau was just like himself. And yet Esau wasn't anything like that, was he? When Jacob and Esau came together, uh, they embraced his brothers. And Esau received him back into the country. And even Esau, and you know who Esau is, that's Edom. That's the one who sold his birthright. Yet he still loved his brother. Well, here we have Joseph loving his brethren. Now, folks, Joseph looks past this man into the future, for he's a type of Christ who loves his brethren. Joseph is the one who loves the Jews, folks. They're his brethren. 
according to the flesh. This is what the Apostle Paul is talking about in the book of Romans when he said, I would give myself for my brethren according to the flesh. He's talking about the sons of Israel. He's talking about the Jews. And so he wept over them. Do you think the Lord Jesus Christ weeps over the Jews now? Of course he does. Of course he does. How can you be a, a high priest that can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities and not be weeping? You don't serve the office of high priest intellectually. When the high priest went into the Holy of Holies, what did he have on his chest? He had epaulets on his shoulder. He had 12 stones. That represented his power to uphold his authority. But what did he have on his chest? He had a breastplate with 12 stones. Each one. Absolutely. 12 stones on his chest. Each one represented the tribe of Israel. What's the chest mean? Close to his heart. So when he went into the Holy of Holies, high priest, only one that can do that. Just a regular priest cannot do that. High priest, once a year, Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, seventh month, tenth day of the month, he goes into the Holy of Holies and he bears in his heart the children of Israel. Notice, no stones on the head. It's not intellectual. Your heart will minister when your mind runs out. The heart can reach another person long before your intellectual arguments ever reach them. There's an awful lot of people out there that like to argue about the Bible and argue about Scripture and argue about spiritual things. But they can't argue with you when you come and help them and they don't deserve being helped. It's hard to argue with a man that will take his shirt off and give it to you. It's hard to argue with somebody that will give you the last bite, that he, give you the money to buy the last bite that, he's, that you could eat. It's hard to argue with a man like that, isn't it? Yes, it is. The power of our ministry is not intellectual. The power of our ministry is by the Spirit of the living God, ministered from the heart. Amen. This is why Paul told the church at Corinth, he says, we don't come in the wisdom of men, but we come in the wisdom of God. And so he says here in the book of Genesis, he wept. And then he revealed himself to them. Of course, you know, that goes off under the fact that Christ is going to reveal himself to the Jew. Luke 7, 38. And stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears. And did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Boy, I'll tell you, I bet that Pharisee was embarrassed. Something like that went on in his house. I mean, this woman of ill repute, who, who, who doesn't know who this woman is? I mean, good night, what's the club going to think of me? How am I going to face the clique? How am I ever going to write another paper for some religious publication? How am I ever going to be part of the scene anymore? I mean, look what's been in my house. Here's a man that calls himself a prophet, and here's a woman that's one of the greatest sinners in town, and they're in my house. Why, when people find out about this, this I'm washed up in the religious community. You need to be. Amen. That'd be the best thing ever happened to you. It's when the religious community turns its back on you, and you're left with nothing but Christ. What a terrible thing. You remember the woman that was taken in adultery? You know what they did with her? They brought her to Christ. <laughs> Their motive was absolutely wrong, but the wisdom of God made it right. They couldn't have taken her to a better place. <laughs> they didn't take her to Christ to get her saved. They took her to Christ to get her condemned. And so the wisdom of God is greater than the wisdom of men. Regardless of how you take somebody to the Lord, take them. <laughs> And she came, and this one wiped his feet and kissed them with the hair of her head. Now, if you read the Bible a little bit, you know in 1 Corinthians 10 it says a woman's hair is giving to her as a covering, right? It's her glory. Her hair is her glory. A man should have, not have long hair. The Bible said it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's against nature. It's a shame for a man to have long hair. But the Apostle Paul went on to say, and I'm not going to dogfight with you and argue with you about it. He said, if this, if you're going to, be, if you're going to, if you're going to, if you're going to, if you're going to make it that you've got to have long hair, you go right ahead. I'll let the Holy Ghost take care of you on that thing. But here's the point. The woman's hair is her glory. So she got down with all of her glory, every bit of it, and she put it on his feet. She washed his feet with her glory. In plain words, she said, I'm taking my glory off. Your feet are greater than my covering. I'll just take my covering and 
I wash you from it. I need tears. I need something to wash with. Amen. Didn't have any water, didn't need any. The water came from a fountain that will never run dry, that bubbles up like Gihon, a spring coming up from the soul. And that water that rises from the soul comes out of the, out of the tear ducts, and she washed his feet. My, my, my. Folks, that's one of the most precious spiritual things in the whole New Testament. It's like the woman who brought the, 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 the vial of spikenard and broke it, and the whole house was filled with the fragrance. You can smell holiness. You can feel holiness. You can see holiness. You can witness it in your soul. And boy, when you do, it does something for you. I'm going to meet her. I'm going to meet. It's like when the Apostle Paul over there was talking about Onesiphorus. I forget which book it's in. I've read it a dozen times in the last few weeks, but I think it's in Timothy. And Paul's talking about Onesiphorus. He says, he said, God bless him, God reward him. He said, because when I was in Rome, he sought me out. He sought me out. And Rome's a pretty big, pretty big place. And he wouldn't stop. He said, You've seen Paul? You know where Paul is? Paul who? The Apostle Paul. What's an apostle? And from one to the other, he's looking for Saul of Tarsus, Paul the Apostle, and he finally found him. God rewarded him for his, uh, for his tenacity. He stayed with it, and God blessed him. Onesiphorus said, God bless the house of Onesiphorus. Has God blessed your house? He's blessed my house. <laughs> oh, yeah. I went to UT Hospital the other day, and God does this for me, and I'm glad he does. I was going to UT Hospital, and you know the underpasses of the interstate? Well, this if you're going to UT Hospital, uh, I, don't, I can't, I don't know if I'm, if you're going 40 west, and you take the exit, and you go up underneath the interstate, and then you come up, and you go right around and hit UT Hospital, there's a bridge right there. And I always look to see who's sleeping under the bridge. I didn't see anybody, but I saw their clothes. They were there. They'd been sleeping under the bridge. You know what I say when I see that? That could be me. That could be me. <laughs> that could be me. I could be laying under that bridge with a bottle of cheap wine, beat up, sleeping under a bridge, nothing to eat, lost without God and going to hell. And that's where I was headed without the grace of God. And now I go home to a nice home, nice warm home, got plenty to eat, got a wonderful wife and a family. Amen. Where'd that come from? That came from God. By the grace of God, I'll never forget who feeds me Amen. and clothes me and helps me. Well, we come on down, and the Bible says in Psalm 137, By the rivers of Babylon, verse 1, there we sat down, yea, we wept, when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they carried us away captive. For there they that carried us away captive. Required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget the O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. They've got two terms here for the Holy Land, Zion and Jerusalem. All right, they're both talking about the same place, but they mean different things. Zion is the Hebrew word which means strength, fortress, strong, Zion. Jerusalem is Jerusalem, the city of peace. It was the Jebusites that had it till David took it. And David was the only one who was able to do it, and it became the capital of Israel. Still is, by the way. The State Department will catch up on these days. And when the State Department finally wises up and realizes that God gave them that land and Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, then the State Department will put their embassy in the capital because that's where they normally put them, in the capital of the country, instead of Tel Aviv, like it is now. I just thought I'd mention that tonight. 
It doesn't make a difference if you're Republican or Democrat. <laughs> Uh, they need to understand the fact that Jerusalem is the ancient capital of Israel, city of peace. It's quite a thing, though, for our Lord Jesus Christ was crucified in the city of peace. But Zion is strength. So what they're saying here is we remembered Zion. We remember the time of the strength of the Lord. We remember the time when we could sing the songs of Zion. We had our priesthood. We had our temple. We had the offering of the sacrifices. We would ascend up to the mountain of the Lord. When we got to the top, 5,000 men would be up there singing the songs of Zion and the glory of the Lord. In the book of Hezekiah talks about the degrees and the psalms. The degrees as you ascend up into the top of that mountain. Who can go up to the mount of the Lord? And to reach to the zenith of that is to reach up into the presence of God and feel the power of God and know that we're the chosen people and the chosen nation and know that we're home. And this is what we're about. Not because we have huge armies, not because we're rich, but because we have the one true living God. And so that's Zion. But then they thought about Jerusalem too. They thought about the city of David, the city of peace, the city where God had brought them together and built the walls about it. And it was a place where they could come and fellowship with their families and with their people and bring sacrifices and offerings to the temple. They had a wonderful place, folks, no doubt about it. But now they're in Babylon. Now they're in Babylon. They're in Nimrod's country. Babylon was the country of Nimrod. If you remember, uh, he was, uh, the, the, his kingdom was, was the land of Shinar, it says in the book of Genesis. Nimrod, the first rebel against God, who organized a one-world government to overthrow the throne of God. And so these Babylonians want the Jews to sing the songs of Zion. We can't do it in a strange land, they said. Them men sitting right now in bars with beer in front of them that used to preach the word of God. There are deacons out there in the world that have left their wives and run off with some woman that at one time had been faithful servants of the Lord in the church. There are Christians out there that haven't heard the songs of Zion in a long time, in a long time. I don't know what you want to call it, but probably it's one of the greatest curses that you can possibly have is this. You'll never forget it. Once you've been born again, you'll never forget once you know the Lord. I don't care how far you run, how fast you run, how far you think you can get away from God, you won't get away from him. And I'd like to say to you tonight, if you're listening, come back. <laughs> come back. Come back. That's your home. You're not at home. Come back home. You'll find the Father at the head of the hill looking down the road, and he's ready to kill the fatted calf for you. He goes out every day, and he looks for his son to come home. The Father is waiting, and the Father's looking. Come home. Are you in this house tonight, and you need to come home? Why don't you come home to it? If you hear this later, if you're watching it over the Internet, just get down where you are right now. You don't have to be in a church house. Just get down on your knees and say, Lord, I'm coming home. I'm tired of fighting. I'm giving up. I'm surrendering. I'm coming home. And leave it behind you. And you'll hear the songs of Zion again. You'll come back to the land of your, of your fathers. You'll come back where you belong. Father, in thy name we pray. Holy One. <laughs> God, you've spoken to somebody. This is for somebody, Lord. There's somebody that took this in tonight. They needed it. Help them come home, Lord. Help them come home. In Jesus' name we pray. And for Jesus' sake, I ask it. Amen. What do we got, brother? Page 382 in the All American Church.